In Peter's first epistle, we're told that God raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. But after you have suffered a little while, I was addressing you now, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory will restore and establish and strengthen you. The Bible is all about you. It's not about any being outside of you. So he raised Christ from the dead. But man is not aware of the fact that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he raised him, he gave him glory. But what is glory? We turn now to the book of Exodus. And I will make my glory pass. I will cover you. And then, as I pass by, he makes his glory. I make my glory to pass. I will cover you. And then when I have passed by, he equates my glory with himself. My glory is equal to I. God and glory are synonymous terms. So he raises you from the dead and gives you Glory he gives you himself. That's the purpose of the entire play. And after you have suffered a little while, we think you suffer so long, but he tells us after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, will restore establish and strengthen you. Well, to restore is to put back into an original state. You are the one who fell, and your whole vast world is yourself fragmented. The whole vast world is yourself pushed out. And he will raise you, so your faith and hope are in God. And he will raise you from the dead and give you glory. That is, he gives you himself. There is nothing but God in the world. I tried to tell you something last Friday. I received a letter from someone who was present and they said, that they did not understand my answer. I am quite sure the gentleman who asked the question understood it. He is here tonight. I said then that the whole vast play of 6,000 years is repetitive. Things appear, they wax, they wane, they disappear. And without this story, which is the story of the gospel, it would simply be eternal hell. What would it matter if you accomplished everything in this world and the end was eternal death? But buried in the play was a plan from the beginning. It was before that the world was. Then I told the gentleman who asked the question concerning Abraham, how we take a play beginning, say, with Abraham, bringing itself to the climax of what we call Jesus Christ. And then we take sections of a play straight over 6,000 years, and then we pull it into a focus. 
which gives meaning to the entire play. So that in 1260 days, Abraham, David, Jesus Christ, the story in the desert of the serpent, all come into focus. And you experience the entire true story buried in that play. So you are raised through a definite plan. Well, who is raised? Well, you were before that the world was. I have accomplished the work thou gavest me to do. Thou, Father, return unto me the glory that was mine, the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. I gave it up willingly. I volunteered to die knowing that I could overcome death. When I speak of myself, I'm speaking of Christ in you. For it is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. And glory is God. So we are now being brought to glory, as told us in the second chapter of Hebrews. Speaking of God as bringing many sons to glory. Not all came down, as we are told in Scripture. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And in the story of the two sons, the prodigal son, <clears throat> and the one that did not come out, he had no knowledge of his wealth. And he complained that now you kill the fatted calf, and you place the rope upon him. And you place, place the ring upon him, and the scepter in his hand, and sandals on his feet. And he went berserk, and wasted. But he said, yes, my son, your brother, he was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. You are always with me, and all that I have is yours. But the son couldn't kill even one little lamb. He had no consciousness of his infinite will. It takes this horror to make us aware that we are the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is God. So we come into this world of death, into this world of horror, where everything vanishes. The ideal dream today that you realize in its fullness fades and then it vanishes. Or you leave it behind and others spend it for you. We build monuments to ourselves, name cities after ourselves, name rivers, name mountains, name all things, and carve our faces in mountains thinking we'll last forever. And all these are garments. The real being is spoken of as something other than self. The only being in this world is God. The only one that radiates it's himself is Jesus Christ. He radiates and reflects the glory of God and bears the express image of his person. And Christ in you is the hope of glory. That Christ in you will be raised from the dead. Not from a cemetery. You have never been placed in a cemetery. You were in the beginning placed in that holy sepulchre, which is your own wonderful skull. That's where you're buried. And one day you will be called from that grave. As we are told, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will raise you also. Why? Because Christ is in me. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me, well then he will raise me also because the identity of me dwells in me. My true identity is the Lord Jesus Christ. My true identity is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So the glory spoken of is not some peculiar thing on the outside, it is God. <coughs> infinite joy, infinite wisdom, infinite power is buried within him. For he who raised him dwells within him, and he's raising his image, that he may reflect and radiate the invisible you. So when you're told, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as though something strange were happening to you. Rejoice that you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, that you may also rejoice when the glory of Christ is revealed. And so I tell you from my own personal experience that your true being is Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? The only God. And so am I, and so are you. So in the end, after a little suffering, we think it's so long, because we must say goodbye to those we love most <clears throat> in this world. Whether it be my father, my mother, I have said goodbye to them. When I so dearly loved them, I said goodbye to a niece, a nephew, to so many of my friends. And so they departed. And those who love me, well, say goodbye to me too. And so this is suffering, no question about it. Aside from the physical pain that we all go through, we also have other ways of suffering. Bankruptcy is suffering. The embarrassment that comes with bankruptcy, or being unemployed and still having all the obligations of life. So all these things come to men, and these are the sufferings of Christ. What other Christ? Your own wonderful human imagination is Christ. That is the only God in the world. And within your own wonderful human imagination, the whole vast world exists. So when Peter, in his very short chapters, the only five chapters, when he said that the prophets who prophesied of the sufferings that would come upon Christ, and they inquired as to what person or what time was indicated by this spirit of Christ within them when they prophesied of these sufferings. And it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. For the time had not yet come. They were simply recording an adumbration, an entire wonderful play of horrors. Yes, joy and woe were woven fine, but so much horror. Then when the time had fully come, and not before, it erupted in one. And the pattern unfolded in him. And we worship that pattern and call it a man. And it's the pattern, the pattern man buried in every child born of woman. And when that pattern is brought into focus, it rises in the individual. And the individual experiences everything recorded in scripture concerning Jesus Christ. And he doesn't have to ask anyone of this world to interpret it for him. He still walks the earth and he walks as John, Mary, called by any name. But he knows what happened to him. And he cannot deny the experience. And he knows these experiences could only happen to Jesus Christ. And he has experienced them. So he knows the reality of that statement in Colossians. It is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Were he not in you, your life would be hopeless. But because he is buried in you, whatever is said in scripture concerning Jesus Christ, you are going to experience. And you're going to have the same denial when you experience it. He comes unto his own, and his own receive them not. He will tell his own who he is, and they will reject it, because they know his physical background. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
So he's speaking of a man that can inherit the kingdom of God. For it was that man that came down from the kingdom of God and deliberately assumed the weaknesses and the limitations of human flesh that he may overcome death. He didn't pretend he was going to die. He died and completely forgot that he is the Son of God being raised now to God. For he brings many sons to glory, and glory and God are identical terms. So he's bringing those that he selected in the beginning. Not all came out. Only what he chose did he bring out. And it was God who fell. It is God who is buried in your skull. And when he awakes, it's you who awake then you will realize, were he not in you, he could not emerge from you. And no one can ascend into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So you'll realize who it is when you wake. And you will know that not until that moment did you realize that you had been buried. Not for one moment did you entertain the thought that this was not a dream. This was all a dream and you didn't know it. And the dreamer was buried in you all along. And the dreamer was God. His first name was Joseph, the dreamer. His name was changed from Joseph to Joshua, which means Jesus. And Jesus and Jehovah are identical in meaning. Jehovah saves. And Jesus is called the Savior of the world. And so the dreamer, Joseph, was buried in man, and his name changed from Joseph to Joshua, which is Jesus. So when the dream awakes, it is God who awakes. And then God's play is the gospel. So the gospel must now unfold itself in the one in whom God awakes. So the first thing is resurrection. He awakes. And then comes his birth from above. For you are told, unless you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you're on your way back to the source, which you deliberately gave up to come down into this world of death. So it begins then with resurrection, quickly followed in a matter of seconds by your birth from above. And then comes the play now. Here is the promise made real. The child is laughing. Then comes the discovery, 1,000 years later, if you read the play, and it would be a repetitious play, over and over with no escape. And suddenly now, the sun is going to appear, and you escape. The sun appears, and you know exactly who he is, yet between that sun appearing and the child's birth is a 1,000 years, if you read the story correctly. Yet in your own experience, it's only a matter of months between the appearance of the sun and the birth of love. Exactly 139 days. And then here is a story buried in the book concerning the ascent and the escape from Israel, from Egypt. And it's all tied into a serpent. Who would have thought for one moment that that is literally true and that you experience it? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then you, like a fiery serpent, you ascend into heaven. And here is the being that you really are. That fiery power, infinite power, infinite wisdom. And it's God. So, if you are here tonight who wrote the letter, I hope my friend who asked it, because that was Stan who asked it. What is the story concerning Abraham tied into this? Well, I thought I made it clear, but evidently I didn't. I hope I did to him because he asked it. But the story begins with Abraham. And people take it as a physical story. It's not a physical story. The drama is unfolding in man. So you come into this world and assume death. These bodies die. They seem so strong. 
and then they wax. But there comes that turning point, and then they wane, and then they fade, and then they bend. So everything dies. We're told the stars are melting. So everything in this universe is dying. But there's something buried in it that cannot die. It is God. And when I read the Monday morning papers after the services on Sunday, I stand aghast at these men who are talking from pulpits and speaking of the story of Jesus Christ as some little secular history that took place 2,000 years ago. It has nothing to do with any man who walked the face of this earth 2,000 years ago. It is all about the eternal plan. And it's Christ in man, in humanity. But he comes one by one, he awakens in each. And together it forms the one man. And that one man is God. As Blake said it so beautifully, Thou art a man, God is no more. Thy own humanity learn to adore. If you humble yourself, you humble me. Because God is man. God actually became humanity. Every child, whether the child be a moron or not, it became every child. And he tells us, it's only a little while that you suffer. But we, suffering, think it's so long. How long, oh Lord, who long? How long? But then he promises us, when the chief shepherd is manifested, the chief shepherd, but who is the chief shepherd? Is he not God? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And when the chief shepherd is manifested, then you will see his glory. For the shepherd is God, and the Son glorifies the Father. You will see the Son, and then you will know who you are. And I can't tell anyone the thrill that comes to you when memory is restored. When all of a sudden your memory returns, and you have been sleeping for these thousands of years, dreaming this dream of life. But well, then you have awakened. As Shelley tells it so beautifully, that statement. He has awakened from the dream of life. Tis we who are lost in stormy visions and keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife. But we are the ones spoken of in Scripture when they use the word Jesus Christ. You are Jesus Christ. But you are sleeping. And I know from my own experience you would not be here, those who are faithful in coming here, were you not at the end. You are at the end. I'm not saying you will not suffer between now and then. You are civilized and you have friends and relatives that you love dearly. And you will have the experience of saying goodbye to those you love dearly. And they will have the experience of saying goodbye to you. It's all part of the play. That you may suffer with Christ for just a little while. And the God of all grace, well, grace means the gift of God to man, unearned, unmerited, which is the gift of himself. He raises us from sonship to fatherhood. He raises all sons to glory. Well, if he raises them to glory, and glory is God, who raises you to God the Father. <clears throat> and who sitting here tonight, who in the world, I'm speaking of everyone in the world, would actually have thought for one moment without revelation that they are the Father of the Son of God. They can't even bring themselves to believe that they are the Son of God, far less being the Father of the Son of God. And I tell you, you are destined to have the experience of being God the Father and His Son calling you Father. And you will know it. This is not a play anymore. Suddenly reality returns. This is the play. And then all of a sudden reality, in the midst of it all, returns. And that was buried there all along, and no one saw it. So when we read in the first epistle, 
the first chapter of Peter, that the prophets who prophesied of the suffering, they inquired as to what person or what time was meant when it was indicated concerning the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. And it was revealed to them, it's not about you, about others in this world. It's not about the prophets who re recorded it. It's all about those who will come at the fullness of time. And you are the one spoken of in Scripture. So the glory, well, what man in this world could even conceive of it? You speak of the glory of a son. There is nothing that you can use, no image in the world that you can use to radiate this glory or to describe the glory. <coughs> but you are man, you are man. Your body I cannot describe. I can describe the face, <coughs> I can describe the hands and the voice, but I can't describe the body. It's radiant and it's all power <coughs> for me. <coughs> And it's all wisdom. And it's all love. The form is infinite love. The human form divine is all love. And how can I describe love as a form? And yet exactly what I mean. <clears throat> because when you stand in the presence of God, He is infinite love. And you can't think of anything but love in His presence. And you're He. For the minute he embraces you, and you fuse and you become one, the very face that you saw becomes your face. <clears throat> Yet, you are floating in being, and for purposes of your own, you can assume any form, any face. But the face, all will wear that face. So in the end, there's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. And you are that one. And may I tell you, it's going to happen to you whether you ate it or not. And you can't ate it. It's a gift. It's being restored. He will restore and establish and strengthen you. After you have suffered a little while. Read that in the fifth chapter of Peter. I think it's the tenth verse. After you suffer a little while. The God of all grace. That's the one. Who will give you his glory. Which is giving you himself. So no matter what the suffering of anyone in this world today, it is nothing compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. So when Paul wrote that marvelous letter to the... So no matter what the suffering of anyone in this world today, it is nothing compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. So when Paul wrote that marvelous letter to the Romans, he said, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And he ends it on that fabulous note that no power in the world can separate us from the love of God. For God is love and you are incorporated into the body of love and no power in the world can separate you from it. So do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as though something strange were happening to you. It will come. I went through it. And you think you're going insane. And if you voice what is happening to you, those around you will be concerned because they will think you're going insane. But may I tell you, you are not going insane. These things happen. And then suddenly, out of the nowhere, that entire plan comes together into focus. And you are the central character and the whole thing erupts within you. Were it not in you, it could not erupt. 
If God was not now immersed and buried in you, he could not unfold in you. And he unfolds himself in that plan. And it begins with his awakening in you as you. You don't see another one awakening, it's you. You awake. And you know exactly where you are. You're in your skull, but you also know what it is. You know it is a tomb. There's no doubt in your mind as to what it is. It's a tomb. There's no doubt as to the fact it is sealed. But you also have an innate wisdom as to how to get out. And you know you simply push and something's going to roll away. And you do. You push and something rolls away. And you come out just like a child being born. And then the witnesses are there as told us in Genesis. That's where Abraham comes in. There were three who suddenly appeared. He did not see them approaching from without. They suddenly appeared, bringing the news of birth. And Abraham believed, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Therefore, righteousness in Scripture is equated with faith. He had the faith to believe that nothing was too hard for God. So he believed, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. While the whole vast world takes the word righteous and uses strange concepts of it. Some holy concept has nothing to do with that. Can you believe the most incredible story in the world? That you are going to have a child? Now go beyond that into a more incredible state. That you're going to be born out of your own skull. And the proof of your birth is going to be a child wrapped in swaddling clothes. Can you believe that? Well, that's the story told. Abraham believed it. And there were three witnesses sent from God. And the three do come. And here they are right before you. And the child is before you too. And you are now spirit. And so if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will raise you also. Why? Because Christ Jesus, that pattern man, is in you. He will raise that pattern. And you, the Spirit of God, will experience that pattern. For you are the Spirit of God. For if the Spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, well, he dwells in you. But who raised him? The Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is God. And he dwells in you. May I tell you, the word spirit and the word wind are one in Hebrew and in Greek. And it is the wind that you hear. This unearthly wind, a fantastic wind. And it's the spirit of God who actually awoke himself because you are God. But it comes at the appointed hour. Everything comes on time. At that appointed hour, he waits. And there he is in you. Well, without this story, what on earth would anything of this world matter? What would it matter if you became president of this country, this fabulous land, at the next election? If at your death, that is it. What would it matter if you own a billion or billions, and at your death, it's all over? Wouldn't that be the most horrible, sorry thing in the world? But it isn't true. You are in a mortal being. God actually became humanity and is buried in man for a divine purpose. And he will awake in the individual. That's how personal it is. Not awake in humanity collectively, but individually, as we are told in the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. We are called each in order. One by one, as we are told in Isaiah, I will call you one by one. But first I try you in the furnaces of affliction. Why? For my own sake I do it. For my own sake. For my name shall not be profaned. My glory I will not give to another. Well, the glory, his glory is himself. He cannot give himself to another. He has to make you himself, which is God the Father, for you are his son. 
But he's going to bring all these sons to glory, which means bring the son to himself, to the level of being God the Father. So each son is being raised from the level of being the son of God to the level of being God the Father. And he can't do it and give it to another. And so you go through the furnaces of affliction because he cannot give his glory, which is himself, to another. Read it carefully. I will make my glory pass before you, and I will cover you. And when I have passed by, well, the I is glory. So he gives you himself, and that self is God the Father. And then when you have that experience and you take off this garment, you take it off for the last time. So do not despair of the millions who have gone without having had the experience, they're going to have it. For everyone who departs this world, do not go into any cemetery. They don't go any place, they simply are restored. When that little breath departs, they are restored. And what was the form here, that form, they're restored into that form, but young. Young and not a thing missing in a world just like this. The world is restored. And they continue until this pattern unfolds within them. If one could only catch himself in the mood of a dream and see what he's doing, he'll realize it is a dream. But I want to encourage those who are having, at the moment, a few difficult moments because of vision. But do not share it. Don't tell anyone. Just keep it to yourself. It's only a little while. This fiery ordeal will last. And then suddenly it happens. And then you are at peace. And you're told to rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ. That you also may rejoice in the glory that is to be revealed. And it's revealed in you. For you aren't going to see him coming from without, as all the great evangelists are talking about. They're waiting for him to come, to appear on some mountainside. They wouldn't recognize him. But whenever he comes, he is denied. Whenever he comes into the world, he is denied. Because he does not belong to this world. They know the background, the physical background of every person. You're all numbers now. And exactly what your number is. Your, your father had a number, your mother had a number, and so you're only a number in the eyes of our country. Everybody has a number. And so they know your number, so you can't come telling them that you came down from heaven. They know you came out of your mother's womb and she has a number. So they have that recorded. And so when Christ appears in man, he has to be denied. He comes to his own and his own receives him not. And he tells the world, I am not of this world. And they know very well he is of this world because they do not see Christ. They only see the garment that he wears. And as Blake said and called the one who is so blind, he calls him Satan. He said, O oh, Satan, thou art but a dunce and canst not tell the garment from the man. Well, that's the whole vast world is Satan, the doubter, who cannot tell the garment that God wears from he who wears it. They cannot see him. And so they only see the garment that he wears, and that garment is tied. It has a number. They know its physical parents, its whole ancestors. And he denies that these are his father and mother. And then he tells them, if you saw me, you would see my father also. For I and my father are one. So you do not know me because you do not know my father. So you will put me out of the synagogues, excommunicate me. And then you will kill me and think you do God a service. And that is the entire world in which we live condemn you from here to the ends of time because 
it happens in you. For their whole concept of God is false. The whole thing is false. Well, I can only reach a few, but you can reach a few. And those you reach, they will reach. So Paul asked the question, who then is Apollos? And who then is Paul? And he answers it for us. Servants through whom you believe, as God assigned to each. So the garment that you wear, this thing called Neville, this was assigned a certain part to play. Therefore, who is Neville? A servant through whom you believe, as God assigned it to him. So who is Apollos? Who is Paul? Servants through whom you believe. And when he sends, all right, there will be that that he will call. For no one comes unto me, save my father calls him. And though small, that one will believe. A few at the very end will drop out, as told you in the sixth chapter of John. When it came very hard to believe what he is talking about, they were called hard sayings. And then one said, who can believe these? Who can accept these? For well, these are hard things. And then they departed, never to walk with him again. Then he turned to Peter. And he said to Peter, wouldst thou go also? And Peter answered, to whom would we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Oh yes, they're difficult to accept. But if these are the realities, then to whom would we go? And the few walked with him to the end. But even those who walked with him to the end denied him up to the very end. If it meant the loss of their physical little body. So they say, I do not know him. And three times he denied him. And then the cock crowed. But the drama is forever. And this vast, vast story of 6,000 years comes into focus in just a matter of moments and begins rapidly to unfold within you and then you know who you are. But I am telling you from experience, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing in the world but Jesus Christ. So in the end, when he was transfigured before them, they saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus and when their eyes were open they saw Jesus only for there's nothing but Jesus he didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the prophecy of Elijah he came to fulfill them and having fulfilled both the law and the prophets there is Jesus only so in the end there is only Jesus and you will awake one day to know that you are here for everything said of him, you are going to experience. And then you'll walk the earth, and you will tell it to the best of your ability. And to those who will accept, and those who will reject. But the little garment that you wear, make no effort to have it leave a footprint on earth. For everything vanishes there. So the little name you wear now, that will vanish, because your real name is Jesus Christ. That's your true identity. You are the Lord God, Jesus Christ. Now let us go into the silence. Good. Now are there any questions please? In the 22nd Psalm, the word translated dog is a euphemism for homosexual when he said the dog surround me. Yet the dog is a symbol of faith in Scripture. It's carried 
the only companion that could walk across into the promised land was Joshua. Moses could not go. And yet Caleb followed and went as companion. And Caleb means dog. Yet the word Caleb by definition means a male harlot in the service of the temple. Because the priesthoods of the past, like the priesthoods of today, hiding under these moral uh, cloaks that they wear, many of them are homosexual, 